Um, and unlike waterfront property, for example, that might change hands once every second or third generation, when an independent agency sells, it's gone. It gets integrated in. There's no, almost never, um, pulling it back out from the agency that acquired it. Peter, welcome to Uncaptive Agent, the Future of Insurance, uh, the podcast that we're doing on the future direction of insurance distribution in the United States over the next three to five years. Uh, and so the next three to five years, we're talking today in October of 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. And everyone, uh, Peter Milnes is my guest today. Peter is the CEO of Optisure, which is an insurance agency organization with a number of outlets all across the eastern seaboard of the United States. Peter's a serial entrepreneur and is also the founder of Virtual Insurance Pro, which is a BPO or a, a service provider to those of us in the insurance agency business. But the really cool thing about Peter's business is everyone's located in the United States and perhaps he'll tell us a little bit more about that in just a minute. So Peter, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Tony. Glad to be here and be able to be, uh, start participating with you. Yeah, so I'm uh, excited. So Peter and I know each other from a great program called Strategic Coach. Dan Sullivan is our coach and uh, you know Peter, uh, Dan inspired me to start the podcast really as research for a book that I'm planning to write next year, but also as just a way to talk to really bright people who are in the business and thinking about the future. And so uh, I know that's, that describes you from our previous conversations and the business that you're doing. So thank you again for being with me. Um, you know, you are a, a, what I would call a serial entrepreneur in the insurance distribution space. Would you tell everybody just really quickly a little bit about your background and professional uh, experience? Sure. Thank you, Tony. So I've been involved in insurance since uh, just about uh, late 79 um, and just love the business. It's a great business to be in. You get to meet great people. You get to, to have great econ autonomy. So over the years I've done, uh, I, I've built a number of insurance businesses on the retail broker side, um, primarily a combination of a, a lot of acquisitions um, as well as building with organic growth and continue to focus on some of my other insurance uh, businesses, uh, both on the investment banking intermediary side, um, buying and selling insurance agencies for other folks, not my account, um, and then ultimately almost not being able to help myself and starting to collect insurance agencies again and transitioning back uh, into not so much doing direct retail personally, um, but um, acquiring entities and books of businesses um, to start another retail presence. Um, and then ultimately in 16, um, I decided that um, I wanted to bring some of our existing folks together, but also uh, broaden our footprint um, and start to work towards developing a new top 100 US broker. Um, so we kicked that off in April of 16. Um, and uh, are a little bit more than halfway there uh, now uh, with a great team of folks, um, as you said, kind of scattered uh, up and down the eastern seaboard with a big presence in the northeast and kind of skipping over to Florida there. So I want to ask a couple follow-up questions about Optisure, but before I do that, I just have to observe a comment you made uh, as you were telling us your history, you know, that you collect insurance agencies and, uh, you know, I collect fountain pens. And so <laughs> I don't know whether your, your hobby is more expensive or just more profitable than mine, but uh, anyway, as a collector of insurance agencies, uh, what are you up to now, would you say, with Optisure? Uh, so we've done a dozen acquisitions of um, agencies coupled with probably a half a dozen follow-on books of business um, there. Um, and so we have about 85 folks, uh, maybe 90-ish um, now. Um, and a, about a third of our overall revenues come from the B side of things. The rest of it is kind of the core property and casualty um, with a number of uh, not silos, but specialties um, along the way there. Okay. Well, certainly you have a lot of experience in uh, in the acquisition business, and I, and and obviously it's been good to you. And so you know, just to start off our conversation about the future, um, you know, 
I heard recently that many of the people who are, are really active uh, uh, in the you know, private equity space, the national brokers and people like that who are looking, I guess it's particularly mid, mid to larger size agencies, feel like there's about four years of inventory left and then I don't know what they're going to do. There's nothing left to buy. Uh, my understanding is you're, you're acquiring, you know, what I'd consider or call, you know, hometown agencies, maybe a little smaller in typical size. Is that, is that fair to say? So, so we kind of range between uh, million five and two and a half mil of revenue in our typical ap acquisition. Um, we've got the ability to not take a cookie cutter approach. Uh, and so we can get to know someone, understand what's important, um, where they fall on the buyer slash seller scale. Um, for some folks, legacy is really important. Um, they want to make sure the agency can continue. Um, for others, it's kind of a hand over the keys and I'm off to go fly fishing or skiing or sailing or whatever it is that they want to do. Right. Okay. Well, how do you see the, uh, as you look at the future in the next three to five years, are we going to reach a saturation point from an acquisition uh, perspective, or do you think this is just going to continue as it's done the last 20 or 30 years and never stop? What, what's the future of agency acquisition from your perspective? Yeah, so, so I have a uh, book similar to you, uh, although mine is still in process, um, and at least the subtitle of it uh, is called The Last Chapter, um, The Extinction of America's great or middle market independent agencies. Um, and you touched on this uh, a few moments ago when you talked about the depletion of inventory. When you look at the current run rate on deals, uh, at least announced deals, um, in the last several years, they've been running at six to 700 announced transactions each year. And when you uh, step back then and take a look at the um, 2018 is the latest one I have I had access to the market stance database. The, the average transaction there was a $5 million revenue um, agency. Um, and when you hold that against the market stance database, you'd say, well, that means there are about 3,600 of those uh, agencies left out uh, there. And you don't need a calculator to do the math backwards and say that is indeed a four, five, six year inventory. Uh, there will be a fair number of those that don't transact because they are legacy oriented, um, intergenerational, um, or they have uh, a good spread um, of age on the ownership side. But I really do think the vast majority of those um, will be gone. The only real exception that I know of over the past you know, five or 10 years has been the influx of banks coming into insurance and banks exiting insurance and some of those agencies being bought back. Uh, but I, I think that what happens here is that the middle disappears um, and you end up with a whole bunch of jumbo agencies um, that have phenomenal concentration of revenue and market share. And then you have a whole bunch of small agencies, um, new agency startups, um, typically people that have um, had a stint somewhere else um, and decided, oh, this could be a big, big, a good business move for me. Um, and so how do I find a way get, to get started? Um, and so again, going back to that market stance database, when you look at the numbers there, they tell you that um, out of the roughly 36,500 agencies uh, in the country, uh, something like 10,000 of those are less than $100,000 of revenue. Uh, so I think the future, at least in terms of demographics, are uh, the big get bigger. Uh, they almost have to uh, because it's hard for them to uh, move the needle with just organic growth um, when you're a 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 million dollar revenue shop. Um, and so you have to move it uh, via acquisition. Um, but that leaves room for a lot of uh, folks going into startup mode um, and rebuilding. So the very big and the very small, and I see a similar things happening. And I'm curious what you think about, where does that put the, the insurance client, the insurance uh, consumer, both from a personal insurance perspective, 
uh, as well as, as commercial. Uh, fewer choices and a real disparity of choice between uh, behemoths and perhaps smaller local agencies that don't have a lot of resources. You know, does this, does this whole trend serve the, the consumer well? How do you feel about that? Um, you have to d divide up the pool uh, uh, based on types of consumers and what they want. I'm a really strong believer that it, as an insurance agency, um, you can play in a lot of different sectors. Um, and, and a lot of how you play, though, is based on the, at the very least, the perception of complexity of the product that you're selling. Um, so if you take a look at auto insurance, for example, there's not necessarily much differentiation at all. For an agency to be able to play in that sector, um, you have to be able to execute on a transactional basis really well. Um, in, in contrast, if you look out at uh, types of insurance, uh, insurance issues um, that have a higher perception and probably reality of complexity, that's where you can see, I think, um, people getting rewarded for a real value add role, a counseling um, role, um, where their knowledge makes a difference in terms of differentiating themselves from um, others. Um, th there's a streamlining of the process. Um, there's a higher level of efficiency. And in some ways, you know, I'd say perhaps the average consumer today doesn't want to have to deal directly with an agent if they have an alternative way to do it. Um, it's kind of the equivalent of what um, you're, when you're working at 615 and you answer the phone and whoever is on the other end says, oh, I didn't really want to talk to you. I just wanted to leave you a voicemail, right? Um, they, they want it quick, efficient, um, and, and have a way to get their problem solved and over and done with and moved on. In the agency of the future, you're going to have a much higher um, scrutiny um, given to what are the rules for the product mix, the sectors, the client types that I'm going to play with and try and find a way to add value to. So, um you know, historically, uh, complex insurance accounts have been the purview of larger agencies, among the reasons, first of all, the knowledge that you talk about, the, the professional knowledge and experience, but also the breadth of carrier representation. And so the rise of market access companies has really negated to some degree the, the uh, need for a, a really uh, intelligent, well-educated agent that you're describing um, to be in a large agency. Um, so you take that idea that, okay, uh, if you're smart and you've got expertise, um, you can find a way to access markets for clients. And you take the historical thing that drives independent agencies, independence, uh, not wanting to be a part of a large bureaucratic organization where somebody's telling you what to do, which is what these behemoths really cannot avoid becoming, really. Uh, and so if you're a transaction-oriented seller, it seems to me that you have a really limited future because that's going to be algorithm-based and done uh, internet or virtual. So with all of that in mind, I mean, uh, and, and, and the rapid loss, if you will, of these mid to large size agencies, do you think there's going to be a, a, an increasing number uh, over time of small boutique or niche uh, agencies with one or two or three uh, experts in them that are operating uh, maybe virtually all over the country uh, serving really complex accounts? I mean, how does that all look to you? Yeah, no, I, I think that you're right about that. Um, having participate in coach you're um, probably familiar with uh, Bill Bishop and his original strategic enterprise uh, thought process and book um, where he talks about getting focused on client types um, and I think that's what the growing agency of the future um, particularly as they start small and look to expand their reach I think that's what they will need to do is focus on client types. I, I think those agencies will become extremely valuable uh, because they will have a much higher level of control over a client type, a client group. I think it won't be transactional based. Um, and I think that those relationships will evolve in a fashion where um, the agent will become the go-to problem solver 
um, irrespective of what the market is doing, um, who's the hot carrier of the day, um, who's getting crazy about whatever it is they might be delivering. It's not new for agents or agencies, for that matter, to uh, niche or target market. But thing else that, that, that I've been thinking a lot about, which is that you can uh, you know, be very narrow in your focus, be very broad in your application. Do you think that agents that are not anywhere or everywhere um, have an existential threat in front of them? If I'm not doing business in 15, 20, 50 states, let's say, uh, am I going to be relevant in the future? You know, Dan's right, as he usually is, uh, because it, it, it is a transportation face-to-face -face game changer. Um, you and I are both pilots, and we historically have had the competitive advantage of we can be in front of anyone in a very, very short period of time, uh, and, and we can get directly to them because of the plethora of airports scattered around the countryside. Um, and so I could be in my Hartford office in, you know, 25, 30 minutes. Zoom's changed that uh, on us. Uh, and, and I think that um, that advantage will come back at some level for us, but not like it uh, was previously, uh, because you, you go from zero cost and uh, we know what it takes to make an airplane fly and that's money, uh, separate and apart from the piloting skills, right? So I, I think it also ties in uh, a, a bit to the aspect of the pandemic currently in that I do believe that there is a drive and a desire uh, at some level amongst any client base for uh, uh, contactless uh, connectivity, uh, the ability to get your information um, real time um, from a client portal, um, whether that's coming from the agency uh, or the carrier. You know, a group of us uh, uh, coach uh, folks, we, we created a fundraiser back at the very beginning of COVID, back in March and April, Whiskey from Home. And uh, one of the guys in, in coach uh, owns a business called Whiskey Alley in Aiken, South Carolina. And he was our, our expert and hooked us up with great bourbon uh, companies, you know, uh, all over the uh, American whiskey landscape. And, and we had a great time uh, drinking bourbon and talking with each other in a virtual cocktail party setting and raised a ton of money for out of work bartenders. And uh, it really opened uh, up my eyes to this, this thing you're talking about, the socialization, which is, you know, it'd be great to be together all in one place, back slapping and all that, and I guess breathing bad smoke in a bar. But, uh, but really, we had as much fun, uh, I think, on Zoom as we'd have had if we were gathered someplace, uh, to your point, at a whole. So even uh, the way we socialize, I think, is being radically changed by this new technology. Anyway, if that's all the case, then uh, it seems like agents that don't massively adopt this are missing the opportunity to get into uh, the backyards of other agents because uh, someone's going to be getting in their backyard if they're not. I, I know uh, five years ago, I bought a, uh, a telepresence robot, put it in the, in the office so that, you know, if I was out of town, I could c come to meetings. And everybody thinks that's really funny, you know, uh, and, and like a gimmick, but it was actually a great time saver um, and allowed you to be literally in two places at once. We use it still a lot, but you couldn't get anybody on a Zoom call until February or March, of, or March of this year. I mean, you know, what's Zoom? Nobody heard of it. Go to meeting was not working. And, uh, and uh, you know, this is early days, right? So Zoom is going to be something completely different five years from now. So anyway, with that in mind, I mean, you're, you're acquiring agencies, building a, another large insurance organization uh, for the second or third time. But earlier you said down uh, the Eastern Seaboard, do you have plans to jump across the country and, and take advantage of this technology in your own work? I don't disagree with you that there is a level that this is one component of virtualization. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, um, yes, we'll have VR headsets, um, we'll have VR glasses uh, at some point, and you know what, um, it'll be back to Star Wars and Princess Leia holograms, ultimately, uh, uh, where we can mix together with and have avatars um, that interact with each other and we're not fussing with 
the, the headset and the controllers and things like that. Uh, I don't know how much people really understand this technology in terms of how far along it is, but a, a couple of years ago, I was at Abundance 360, which is a technology conference basically uh, on the West Coast, and Tony Robbins was supposed to speak to us, but he had a previous engagement somewhere on the East Coast, so he came as a hologram. And they, they told us he's going to be there as a hologram. And, you know, they were apologizing to us because he was going to be there as a hologram, not in person. So anyway, when he came out on the stage, I was about, I don't know, 50, 75 feet from the stage. And for about five minutes, I thought, yeah, they're putting us on. He's really here. I mean, uh, you know, they're, they're kidding us. I mean, this isn't right. And he threw his arms out like this, you know, and he went out of the cone of whatever he was in and, he, and his hands disappeared. And that's the first time I realized he's not there. Huh. And it was... Uh, I mean, there was no way that it wasn't a hundred percent as good as if he had been there in person. And, and so, um, I just think you know, one of the things that all of us have to do, whether we're you know in a boring business like insurance distribution, you know, the agency business, or something really exciting, is is understand that that stuff's coming really fast. Uh, and and so, uh, how do how do agents begin? You know, with baby steps to adopt it. So I mentioned that you know I got a telepresence robot. Now we're on Zoom. Um, our good friend uh, Matt Massiello is uh, releasing a, a book uh, next month, as a matter of fact, on uh, virtual insurance agencies and how to move your agency towards virtual. But you mentioned it earlier, and I'm curious what you think are the practical steps for 2020, 2021, maybe looking forward to 22 and three for the average insurance agency to grab technology and use it to lower cost and increase uh, productivity, market position, and competitiveness? What, what are the things agents need to be thinking about and then doing? Yeah, so I've actually thought a lot about that because there is a mind shift that has to become present for that to happen. And so on the Optishore side of things, you know, we. Uh, not that I had any, you know, impending vision of a pandemic, um, but in building the company, um, out of the gate, I had made the decision that we are going to be completely cloud-based um, because I wanted scalability. I, I wanted to be able to do a bolt-on and, and have it be seamless in a very, very short period of time. So uh, on March 15th, I think, we took 80 to 90 people um, remote overnight. Um, and there were very, very few hiccups other than with those folks that had said that they had tested at home, but they hadn't really tested it um, fully, you know. Um, part of that mind shift that we've implemented at Optishore has been um, the formation of um, concentric digital transformation teams. Um, where we've got people focused on, if you see a piece of paper, um, ask yourself why and how it can be eliminated. But go beyond that um, to think about the process that's behind the production of that piece of paper and how do we go about changing that. A quick example, um, when we acquire someone, frequently we'll pick up um, another insurance carrier and we have to go through the recontracting process. Well, the carriers are starting to get it um, in that by and large, many of them have shifted to Adobe Sign or DocuSign for digital signatures. But they've eliminated the piece of paper, but they haven't dealt with the process because they wanna send that contract update uh, to me digitally um, and they, they don't think in terms of enabling someone else to participate in the process because uh, as it hits your, your in-basket, um, they're looking for, okay, they want the EIN number of the old agency, the new agency. They want the transfer date. They want all the contact info. And, and if I were going to do that personally, you know, there's a half an hour to muddle on through this. And they haven't even thought about giving you the ability to upload a canned form. Um, and so um, I had one carrier two weeks ago where I said to one of our folks, listen, I'm not going to get pinged by another Adobe sign document from them. You tell them to print the damn thing out um, and email it or fax it to us. 
and we'll parcel out the pieces um, internally and deal with it that way. So, so that's part of what I'm talking about from a mind shift standpoint. The other thing more broadly though, um, that you know, I, I really am a big advocate of you're getting paid and you will get paid in the future for sure, mostly only for that value add counseling role. Right. So if you're gonna do that, um, you need to break down the agency as it exists now into multiple pieces. And I think in terms of, you know, kind of the Native American legend of the buffalo where no byproduct goes unused uh, there, um, you, you think in terms of the tools that are available now, today, uh, that people could begin implementing. Um, so you have the market access um, aggregators, you're intimately familiar there um, in terms of how to get a smaller agency clout with carriers or appointment with carriers. Um, you think about uh, policy checking um, and how and when that gets done and when it's appropriate to get uh, it done. And some uh, component of that is routinely being offshored. Um, you think about the client contact aspect of it for um, what I characterize a differentiation between reactive service and proactive service. The reactive service, that's what our virtual insurance professional, uh, theinsurancepro.com uh, does. Um, through the magic of a cloud-based automated call distribution unit or um, hot transfers, um, it gets matched up, an, an incoming call from a client gets matched up um, with the appropriate um, person from a knowledge set standpoint and a familiarity with an agency standpoint. Um, so that that is um, not just transparent, it, it's invisible to an agency client calling into an agency. Um, you think about the ability to outsource accounting. Uh, in all of these aspects, and then we could cover a lot more, are ones that traditionally an insurance agency got started because someone was good at selling and they sold a whole mess of insurance. Um, and all of a sudden they realized they had to service that, uh, right? Um, and so they went from doing something that they were good at, their unique ability, uh, building a relationship and providing insurance advice. And now all of a sudden they have to deal with accounting. They have to deal with hiring. They have to deal with supplies. They have to deal with benefit programs. Well, you know, if, if someone is, is, uh, is able to master that process, this uh, cutting up and outsourcing, uh, they're going to do really, really well because they're going to uh, avoid years and years of aggravation of trying to learn how to be a, a master of many things and a, and a, and a manager of many things. Um, but they're also going to grapple with something that I see is coming in the three to five year time frame that we're talking about, which is that uh, agencies are going to have to cut their expenses um, to not only uh, make a profit, to, but to be competitive. And I, I see that coming for a couple of reasons. One is uh, insurance company cost pressures are relentless and uh, they're uh, you know, some of the things that drive their profitability are being uh, relentlessly taken away. And in fact, there's an arms race going on right now among insurance carriers uh, for technology themselves. So those who, you know, speed uh, of being able to produce the business and, and all that is, is driving and is creating insurance companies. Some are haves and some are have nots, right? So uh, there's a lot of carriers that are stuck in manual processes and all kinds of things that are inefficient. And they don't have the capital to, to rapidly you know, keep up with other carriers who are making uh, these great strides in, in their own efficiencies. And so that cost pressure is going to always be reflected uh, at the agent level because uh, at the end of the day, uh, we tend to get, you know, we're, we're an easy target for cost cutting. And so, um, you know, so, so two, two thoughts about that. One is, uh, it, it, to your point, uh, Outsourcing is more efficient, also less costly. With that in mind, and, and I know you're in this business, but what are the things that a typical agency should look at from outsourcing first? Uh, if, you, if there's one, two, three to get started, what are the baby steps? I, I don't disagree with you at all on the carrier service center side of things. I think that, again, there is a component of most agencies' businesses where um, utilization of a service center um, makes a difference. And 
when you think about agencies, every agency that every agency principal that I've ever met in my life, um, when you ask them that what makes them different, um, they'll all say, "We give." good service, um, right? No definition to it, right? Uh, if that were true, there would be no company service centers. Insurance yeah. companies, as you know, got disgusted finally to the point where they said, okay, right. there's a lot of money. If they're not gonna do it, we're gonna have to do it for them. So I think service centers uh, are a component. Um, you know, our, our VIP operation is the equivalent of an all carrier service center because the failing there is that um, we deal in relationships. Um, every bit as much, if not more, than dealing with policies. And there's no one carrier that really is going to deliver across the board there. So you, so you have to come up with, uh, with a mechanism to figure out how to uh, service the pieces that don't fit uh, there one way or another. Um, I, I think also you need to have um, a way to take advantage of economies of scale at the carrier side of things, which is what you deliver to a, a lot of uh, the agencies that uh, you work with. Um, and, and then I think um, there is the general transactional inefficiency uh, built into the current process today. Uh, one of the phenomena that I think is really interesting is so much money flowed into insurtechs uh, uh, in recent years. Um, and so much of that money just burned up um, because their initial premise was that they were going to disrupt the agency client relationship. Um, and along the way, um, they found out that's not such an easy thing to do, right? Um, however, what the smart ones, uh, the ones that didn't completely run out or the ones that figured out how to raise another round, they, they pivoted um, and they took a lot of what they have learned and have redirected it to finding ways to uh, disrupt or transform is a better word, the inefficiencies between client agency and carrier. Um, and so that's a spot that we're looking at a lot for finding ways to um, take cost that doesn't otherwise add value out of the system. Agents tend to think about the top line all the time. I mean, you know, we're, we're really focused on selling a new deal, adding new commission, making a better uh, deal on profit sharing. All that's revenue. And we've been talking about the other part of the income statement, which is the expense side and how really important it is. Um, you know, I, I had a friend 20 something years ago, we were uh, on a hunting trip and I was really excited about how fast the business was growing. And, you know, I was talking about all that. And he said, Tony, I don't give a bleep about the top line. You know, the only thing I care about is growing the bottom line. And everybody in my organization is incentivized to do that. And it really was like getting slapped upside the head with reality because that's the truth, right? I mean, if you focus on growing the bottom line, who cares about the top line? Uh, what do you think the implications are going forward over the next three to five years for how people are going to be compensated? Yeah, I, I think it's a redeployment. Um, and, and it's not going to be a completely successful redeployment because w w when you dissect an insurance agency, um, you've got about a half a dozen levers that you can pull to make a difference uh, relative to what ends up on the bottom line. Um, yes, on the top line, you can sell more. Um, you can find a way to get uh, higher commissions, uh, better commissions, additional commissions out of the carriers. You know, what I see typically is 50 to 55 at the low end, 65 to 70 to 75 at the high end um, there. Uh, and then from an occupancy cost standpoint, most of the time you'll find somewhere around four to five points. I think that's going to change in the future because I think one of the things COVID has taught us is that we can exist in a hybrid model um, and we don't need as much uh, space. I'm not a believer that we're going to eliminate all occupancy costs from an office standpoint because I think that there. Uh, I, I said this earlier, I think Zoom works great for a small group or one-on-one. -on -one. 
Um, I've been in some meetings um, post COVID uh, uh, or, or since the start of COVID where with a half a dozen people, nine people, the dy dynamics, the speed of reaction, the speed of brainstorming and creativity um, is just not duplicated yet uh, by um, a, a video uh, equivalent. But when you consider that, um, as you look around at, um, you pick the source, um, agency universe, best practices, CIC benchmarking, um, I think the general consensus is that a plain vanilla, non-super specialized agency um, is going to ultimately with, uh, well run is going to achieve a margin of somewhere around 30 points. Um, and so that makes you go, uh, the, the difference between a 10 point agency and a 30% um, EBITDA uh, margin agency, um, it, you really have to focus in on that comp and benefits level. And I'm not saying that you slash um, there per se, um, but you've got to do a combination of balance um, and uh, productivity enhancement. And, and so it only makes sense to take folks out of the lower level transaction um, activity and find ways to get them redeployed to that value add counseling role that I just keep preaching about uh, because People will pay for that. Customers will pay for that and feel good about paying for it. Um, you know, I remember back at the beginning of, of my Asian career, I was actually, you know, selling commercial insurance. And it, it frustrated me to some degree that somebody else was determining my compensation. And, and uh, you know, for example, I, I couldn't receive a commission and charge a fee for services you could, you could pick. Um, and agents have been scared to death of, of fees and, and, and uh, going away from a, a, a commission model for a long time. But I wonder if that time isn't coming, where if you feel really good about the services and the value that you're creating and understanding that, you know what, you might be worth 20, 30, 40% of whatever the carrier's charging uh, and deciding to forego commission, you know, eliminating that from your agreement. In fact, I've wondered, you know, why online sellers haven't been doing that already, just eliminating the commissions uh, from their deals with carriers and then, you know, on transactions and saying, hey, buy an auto policy for $7.50. To me, it's coming. It's got to come. Uh, you know, why uh, Scott Trade and all these others can do it in securities and you can't do it in insurance, which would really un upset the apple cart of the economics of transaction sellers. So anyway, just curious what you think about in terms of agent compensation over the next three to five years. Is it going to stay static, change, radically change? What do you think? So I think it is more likely than not to radically change. Um, and again, I think you've got to parse out the products uh, there. Um, and, and part of that change, I think, gets driven by some further level of product commoditization. Um, so, you know, Warren Buffett came out with the idea of this three policy. I mean, we haven't seen a lot about that. Um, but um, the idea of something that becomes simpler and, and is a one size not fits all, but one size fits a certain group. Um, that's an area that I think you'll see a lot of erosion. Um, and I know from my um, prior readings that in 1950, um, they wrote $30,000 of premium in $1950. Um, by 55, um, that had increased to $83 million. Um, and by 1960, um, that had increased to three quarters of a billion dollars uh, in the homeowner's line. So that's, that's the equivalent in, in a 10 year uh, time frame with kind of a tipping point in the middle. That's the equivalent of like $6 billion in uh, today equivalent. And I can see that that could be repeated with a variety of product lines where, again, there's little differentiation. And in doing that, a lot of money is going to disappear out of the system from an agency perspective uh, there. Uh, 
I think another problem with the question that you raise is that um, insurance continues to be regulated at the state level. Um, and so when you start to think about commission versus fee, um, on the one hand, um, in most states, um, you can indeed charge a fee, but you can't charge a fee for what is supposedly included in the commission on the policy. There's no easy way to get a hybrid model, um, even though it might take you thousands of dollars to place um, a commercial policy with issues. Collectively, we have to figure out a way to deal with the idea of uh, segmenting out the compensation for specific pieces that's all bundled in now. You know, it kind of becomes the equivalent of uh, 4.45 on a Friday afternoon, a pickup truck screeches into the parking lot and out jumps a guy with a, um, a, a hammer hanging in off his belt and he runs on in and says, I need to buy a certificate of insurance. Uh, he, he doesn't want coverage. He just wants something to wave to the general contractor so that he gets paid. You know, that, that's the type of segmentation. And, you know, you have to wonder, well, that's all he's going to buy. Do we want to just sell that to him? And if so, what do we want to be paid for, right? Yeah, you know, I don't think this is an easy topic at all. And it's certainly one that agents don't like to even think about, much less talk about. But it just seems to me that with all of the fundamental underpinnings and, and, and assumptions around the agency business that are going to be challenged as we go forward because of the necessity of it being challenged. But um, as we think about wrapping up, just uh, curious, you know, you've had a 40-year career uh, in this business. You, you've You've worked at all kinds of parts of it, probably as, as well-rounded and experienced set as you can have. Um, you know, and I know that you're an optimist and an entrepreneur because you're building a brand new business right now. Um, so with all that said, are you, what's your level of optimism about the future of the independent agency business model and distribution system as compared to, say, the past? better days ahead of us than in the past, or, or, or are we all going to be looking backwards in five years, looking for the glory days? So I think, you know, insurance has been a lifestyle business for many people. Um, it, it used to be that you had to work hard to screw up an insurance agency um, if you got one up and running. And that's not the case anymore. There are a lot more challenges. It's a lot more capital intensive. Uh, the complexity of products is greater. Uh, the education sources for gaining that product knowledge, they, they exist, but in a different fashion. Um, and so the building those educational blocks are neither as easy in some ways, um, nor as frequent. And, and there I'm talking about the disappearance of the great carrier schools uh, that trained so many people so well uh, in the business. It, and so I, I think that those folks that are lifestyle agents, lifestyle business owners, um, their future is not so great. They're the ones that aren't reinvesting. Uh, they're not continuing to develop a skill set. Uh, the age demographics is such that mm, they just don't want to do it anymore. And, and I think that's driving a little bit of a stampede right now um, in terms of exit in the business because you have the double whammy of um, COVID um, it coupled with the prospect of an uncertain election um, and tax change. And so it's kind of like the um, stampede last seen in like 1986 tax reform act, right? Uh, just people heading for the exit. There is a sea change, a new set of rules um, of what you need to do to be successful. Um, I think they will be. Um, I, I think that I, I'm less worried um, about the insure techs uh, taking our clients away from us um, or frankly, even becoming um, a, a trying to become a traditional insurance uh, carrier model because I think um, all too frequently uh, as those people built their business plans, um, the reality of the pricing of our business was lost on them. 
um, because we're one of the few industries where we price our product before we really know what it costs. Wow. And uh, we have to worry about volatility of catastrophic events um, on top of that, uh, swinging the cost uh, markedly. Um, but I, I do remain optimistic. I, I, I think it's a great business with great people. Um, and I think that if you figure out the right set of rules for the market segment that you personally, individually decide to have your organization play in, uh, that you can do really well. Uh, because there is a lot of complexity left in the industry and eliminating the transactional efficiency won't make that go away. Um, and people need to be guided through that um, in the same way that um, people at some level need to be guided through uh, filling out their own tax returns. So I'm still upbeat uh, because I'm going to make sure we're in the category of what do we need to do to keep playing this game. You know, you, your last comment just made me think about the fact that, you know, my CPA is located in San Diego, California. I'm in Oklahoma City. Um, and I, I use that CPA firm because of their specialization in entrepreneurial businesses and because of their talent and expertise. And um, it's irrelevant to me that they're there. I mean, um, you know, we, uh, we've been doing business together on the phone of, via email for years. Zoom is just adding to that. Um, and so, you know, it just as a reminder that um, if we're professionals, you know, we have a future and, and it's a different future than, than what we've got, but it's a really exciting one. So, Peter, thank you for uh, joining me today. This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, it's obvious that you think really deeply about these subjects and uh, your insight is keen and helpful. And so I've enjoyed the conversation and I really do appreciate you being with us, everybody. Peter Mills. Uh, Optisure Group, and uh, thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you again at Coach on a call or maybe in Chicago. In person will be great uh, when we get back to that, Tony. I've enjoyed the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I'm talking to independent agency owners about this all the time. If you'd like to have a more personalized conversation, click on the button or the link in the description, and we'll make that happen. You can also reach out to me at tonycaldwell.net slash contact.